welcome back to Xylia Moto, the show where I attempt to review every English language game released from the 8 and 16-bit era of Sega consoles. After last week's look into the European Master System Library, I announced I would be heading back to the Genesis, but would not be reviewing a sports game. But Dave, you ask, isn't Zany Golf a sports title? I mean, it has golf right there in the title. And I suppose if you really want to argue that this was actually a golf game, then first, I'd probably tell you that you need to get a life, as this is probably about 17,341,000th on the list of things in your daily life that you should be arguing about. And then I would relent because I really just don't care that much in this instance. Having said all that, what I can say is that Zany Golf is a video game based around mini golf, which I've got to say I definitely prefer to regular golf, and I think that opinion is probably shared by almost everyone except actual golfers, and even possibly some of them. One of my favorite memories growing up is playing mini-golf at a chain of entertainment facilities known as Putt-Putt. Putt-Putt, not to be confused with the children's edutainment series of the same name on PC, were known for their bright orange borders around the various holes, along with also having arcades with both regular and ticket machines, and then usually having a food area for various children's parties. Putt-Putt is apparently still around, but it's been somewhat replaced with other mini-golf establishments that aren't part of a centralized franchise, and that feature much more imaginative hole layouts and course decorations. And I think that growth and evolution has been great for the okay fine, I'll call it a sport. Now most complexes that have mini-golf courses usually have multiple to play through, with very creative layouts for each hole as opposed to what I had growing up, which usually consisted of, oh, the hole is on a hill, or, oh, the hole is behind a white post. And I think that previous lack of imagination and the somewhat boring course layouts is part of what birthed the game we're playing today, as the nine holes featured in Zany Golf are not any that you would ever encounter in real life, even if you manage to qualify for something like the recent hit game show, Holy Moly. One of the great things about video games is the ability to create and participate in fantasy. Sometimes that fantasy puts you in a realm of creatures filled with magic and ridiculous swords, and sometimes that fantasy is simply trying to knock a golf ball in a hole on a course that features a gigantic hamburger. And yes, you do attempt that in Zany Golf. Zany Golf didn't originate on the Genesis. It actually had its basis originally on the Apple II GS computer in 1988, and then was later ported to the Amiga, Atari ST, and DOS computers as well before eventually making it on the Genesis in 1990. Zany Golf is actually such an early release for the Genesis that it's not compatible with most Genesis systems. If you're an NES fan, you may be familiar with the 10 NES security system that Nintendo employed in an attempt to prevent unlicensed companies from manufacturing games for the console. The Genesis has a similar system, called TMSS, short for Trademark Security System. However, it works a little bit differently. The problem when it comes to the Genesis and TMSS is that TMSS wasn't implemented on the original run of the Sega Genesis, and as a result, certain old electronic arts and accolade titles won't work unless you have one of these first-run Genesis. Neither of my Model 1 Genesis are from that original production run, and as a result, I wasted about five minutes trying to get Zany Golf to work, before finally figuring this out via a quick Google search. Turns out, the simplest answer is to actually pull out your trusty Game Genie, if you have one, which will allow you to get around the TMSS and boot into the game. So what did I find when I finally got the game up and running? Does it provide an enjoyable run through an imaginary mini golf course featuring outlandish hole designs? Or is it a frustrating early 16-bit title that's an obvious home computer port that should have stayed in the land of mice and keyboards? Well, let's find out. First, a look at the physical package. Okay, I know that was a lengthy preamble, so let's get right at things. I'm actually going to show off both the Game Genie and Zany Golf here, as I doubt I'll ever do a separate video just on the Game Genie. And I think it's appropriate to look at it here, as I wouldn't be playing this game without it. First, uh, the Game Genie. And uh, as you can look and see these boxes side by side, you can immediately see that the Game Genie comes in a much smaller package. Uh, apparently that's because for the Genesis, there are actually two releases of the Game Genie, and this is actually the second one. Uh, I don't think there's any actual functional difference between the two. This is just simply a re-release, with the second version coming with a 
very thick book of Game Genie codes. And the uh, box refers to this as being the second release up in the corner. You see up here this uh, new smaller package outside, same Game Genie power inside. Well, this box is a bit beat up, uh, especially in the lower left-hand corner. You can see this sort of wrinkling here. Uh, I do like how it still has the uh, 29 KB Toys sticker up in the corner. Uh, and it still has the hang tab intact at the back of the box. Uh, opening the box shows that it's basically just large enough to hold the... Uh, the book and the Game Genie itself. I'm going to slide Zany off out of the way a little bit. And here we go. Now, if you notice the Game Genie itself here, this is about the same size as, say, an Electronic Arts cartridge. Or, uh, or an Accolade cartridge. So a little bit taller than your average, you know, actual Sega cartridge. Um, but still, you know, reasonable size. Not, not Nothing too crazy there. Um, and then also the uh, book, codes slash manual. Um, and uh, got, got codes for a lot of games in here. And uh, ironically, no codes for Zany Golf. Um, I, and I believe that's just because, you know, with this being the second release, this did come out, obviously, um, well after Zany Golf did, and I think they were trying to focus, you know, you had limited room for codes in here. They were trying to focus more on, uh, you know, current games and, uh, you know, older games that were very, very popular, trying to, you know, sort of cover all the bases that they could with just this book here. Um I do find it, it, it is kind of interesting at the beginning. Um, this isn't just only codes, as you can see here. There is a section at the beginning, which uh, if you read through it, it's actually got some instructions on how to uh, come up with your own codes. Um, you know, based on, you know, maybe there's a code in here that kind of does what you want to do. Um, but then based on the, you know, the instructions at the beginning, you could maybe come up with your own codes to do things that are, you know, slightly different. So I'll move that to the side for now and get Zany Golf up front and center. Uh, moving on to Zany Golf, like as I said before, it's an early title and as such, like Lakers vs. Celtics in episode 12, it was back when Electronic Arts was using their own cardboard boxes as opposed to clamshells. And this box is actually in really good shape with very little wear and tear. I mean, maybe like the corner's a little bit rounded there and you know, maybe a little bit rubbed off here. But, you know, for the most part, this box is in almost mint condition. Uh, the cover art is pretty good and uses the somewhat standard EA Genesis template at the time. Um, which is, you know, having this inset art here and then some labels on the outside. Uh, I'd like to point out real quick that the reference to game designer Will Harvey on the cover, uh, as this won't be the last Will Harvey Genesis game we'll look at, as he was also responsible for The Immortal. Uh, not sure when we'll get to that one on the schedule, but it's definitely on the list as it's a classic and I already own a copy of it. Uh, flipping over to the back, you can see that the back design definitely carries on with the zany theme and features four nice screenshots, but they're splayed out all over at various angles and such. Um, you know, definitely not cookie cutter and everything on a grid or anything like that. Uh, I think this is actually a really great layout and design and very imaginative. You can tell, definitely tell they had some fun with this one. Uh, opening the box, we've got the cartridge up here, and the manual, assuming I can get it out, and along with the manual, the original registration card, 
And uh, this apparently dates back to um, May of 1990, as you can see by this code down here in the bottom corner. Uh, the manual and the cartridge are both in really good shape, just like the box. Uh, I know this isn't exactly a valuable game, but I really like the fact that I was able to find a copy that had been taken care of so well. Uh, the manual, like the box, is a standard EA format at the time, and uh, doesn't really have a whole lot to it. Uh, granted, uh, there's not exactly a whole lot to explain about this game, as it's pretty much just virtually playing mini golf with up to three of your friends. Uh, however, it does do a good job explaining the general gameplay. And, you know, features a, you know, a decent amount of screenshots and diagrams. And uh, does have a write-up on every hole in the game to, you know, maybe not necessarily give you tips, but just kind of explain, you know, what's going on. Uh, now let's get to uh, some knocking some balls in holes. Or something. I mentioned previously that this Annie Golf was originally a game on various home computers. And that shouldn't come as much as a surprise if you know anything about electronic arts, as a lot of their early Genesis titles were ports of computer games, as that's where they'd built their company from. And as you're probably familiar, home computer titles don't always port well to consoles, especially games that were designed to be played using a mouse. And Zany Golf was most definitely designed to be played with a mouse, as I verified by playing the DOS version as part of the research for this review. However, the core gameplay of Zany Golf is simple enough that it can be translated to the gamepad, with the exception of one level, Magic Carpet, and as such, that hole didn't make the cut to the Genesis version. But that actually works out, as the original computer version actually contained ten holes, as one was a bonus hidden hole, so the Genesis still has a nine-hole half course intact. The game plays simply, as you might imagine, seeing as how real-life mini-golf isn't overly complex. You're given a cursor, represented by a crosshair, and must place that crosshair on the ball, and then while holding down the A button, move the controller in the opposite direction of where you want to hit the ball, drawing a dotted line between the cursor and the ball, with a distance between the cursor and the ball representing how hard you'll hit the ball. As in real life mini golf, a little bit goes a long way, so you have to be somewhat precise in just how hard you choose to hit the ball, as you may inadvertently bounce the ball all over the course and overshoot the hole without meaning to. Also, due to the fact that the game is presented via an isometric viewpoint, you'll have to account for that when attempting to hit the ball at an angle to get around obstacles, or else you'll end up slamming into walls and going off course. The game isn't just straight mini-golf, as you can imagine based on its given title of Zany Golf. Some holes, such as the previously mentioned Hamburger Hill or Pinball Palace, are interactive, and not only do you attempt to hit the ball accurately in an effort to get it in the hole, you have to use your controller to move items or flippers around on the course. This works well and provides a nice added challenge to the game. While I do think the game is slightly more fun on its original mouse implementation, the game surely doesn't suffer from its transition to a gamepad. In a more traditional golf game, each hole has a set par, which is the amount of strokes it expects a player to take to get the ball to the hole. Hitting under par is good, and of course going over par is bad. But usually, going over par has no real actual penalty, other than just doing poorly in competition with others. In mini golf, normally every course has a five or stick, six stroke limit to keep players moving on the courses. Sandy Golf takes that idea of having a stroke limit a bit further and creates a bit of a challenge around it. There are four difficulty levels in Sandy Golf, with the first practice being good for its name and giving you plenty of opportunities to land the holes. However, step up to beginner, intermediate, or advanced, and the game's unique scoring system will start to really come into play. Essentially, you start the game with a set number of strokes, and based on the par for each hole, you'll earn additional strokes based on the par for each hole. This allows you to save up strokes for particular nasty holes, but have two bad holes in a row and you'll be sent packing. I really like this concept as it adds a nice bit of stress to the game, and really makes you have to focus if you want to finish all nine holes. Also, if playing in multiplayer, the scorecard will show the breakdown for everyone's score, including if they bombed out on a certain hole, allowing for additional bragging rights for the players to actually make it to the end. Just as the original computer version did, the Genesis version supports up to four players, with each player being able to choose a color for their ball. 
which is nice just in case you forget whose turn it is. The manual doesn't really spell it out, but it appears that the game has support for multiple controllers as well, allowing you to associate a controller with your player when you choose the ball caller for hitting a button on said controller. Having multiple players is a must for this type of game, and really opens it to being a fun party game, with plenty of trash talking opportunities when players mess up or hit great shots. Being that the game is an early Genesis title, based on an even older computer game, you can imagine that the graphics aren't exactly stellar. And you'd be right. But I wouldn't call them specifically bad, either, at least in the looks department. Judging based on the time period, I think they're actually pretty decent, with some nice quality pixel art in places. However, there are aspects of the game graphically that I do feel like should be called out. The first is the golf ball itself. It doesn't move. I mean, of course it moves across the hole, as you would expect, but it's a static sprite with no animation. So it appears that the ball essentially just floats across the screen with the hole moving behind it. It's not a major problem, but it definitely shows how primitive the game is. The second and more glaring graphical issue is the extreme low frame rate of the game. I'm not exactly sure what about the graphics engine causes this problem, as something like, say, Sonic Hedgehog moves seemingly 100 times as fast, while still featuring nicely detailed backgrounds. The only other game on the system so far that can compare the atrocious frame rate to is PGA Tour Golf. While both games are ports from home computer world, I don't think that their ports is necessarily the problem. For instance, an Amiga port like Shadow of the Beast, which we haven't gotten to yet, is known for actually being too fast. I think in both cases, Electronic Arts was simply too eager to get the releases out for the console, had they spent more time working on optimizing the titles for the Genesis, they could have gotten much smoother performance out of the system. While the low frame rate doesn't really affect how the game plays, what it does affect is the enjoyment of the game. On levels that don't have much interactivity, such as Hamburger Hill or Willis Walls, the low frame rate doesn't cause much issue, as the levels are usually over relatively quickly. But in more interactive levels like Ant Hill, Pinball Palace, or Knockout Nightmare, where after your initial stroke you have to use a controller to guide the ball through the level to the hole, a game engine that operates at one frame per second is a huge issue, and just makes holes boring as you're waiting for the game to animate the action. As poor as the graphics engine operates, the sound makes up for it a bit, specifically the music, as the game features effectively no sound effects. The in-game music was a big focus in the original home computer version, and that has been carried over to the Genesis. Each hole has its own track, and they all sound very similar to what you might have heard if you were playing a Sierra Online adventure game in the early 90s. And while the game doesn't offer much in the way of options, it does offer one very nice one, which is the option to either have the music in each level continuously repeat, or stop after one play, which is a great thing in longer levels. All in all, I'm giving Zany Golf three stars. While it has some glaring issues due to the fact it's an early release, specifically one of Electronic Arts' first three on the Genesis along with Populous and Budokan, and it really could have dealt with the second nine-hole course for some more variety, it's still a fun romp that has a nice level of challenge and has the potential to be an enjoyable party game. If you like mini golf and you're collecting Genesis titles, I definitely recommend picking this one up if you can find it and possibly a Game Genie, so you can actually play the game. Okay, Zany Golf. I've got my mini golf fixed for the winter, as I don't think I'll be able to go outside and play around anytime soon. And I'll take this opportunity to give Holy Moly another shout out. I'm definitely excited for what new things they bring to the TV show for the upcoming season. If you ever wonder what mini golf combined with Wipeout would look and sound like, look no further. Tune in next week when we stay on the Genesis and I torture myself by reviewing another title with frame rates in the single digits. I enjoyed messing around with it in its sequel in the arcades, but I don't think I'd call either good game, and I'm sure the home version isn't going to be any better. At least that's my assumption, I guess I'll find out for certain this week. Remember, whatever you play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later.